Darren Hardy says, the day you graduate from childhood to adulthood is the day you take full responsibility for your life. You're only young once, but you can live immature for a lifetime. Maturity doesn't come with age, but with the acceptance of responsibility. A sign of emotional maturity is when you take appropriate responsibility for your life. You're responsible for how you live your life. You're responsible for the choices that you make. You're responsible for how you think, act, and feel. Look at how you deal with your responsibilities and you can see how spiritually mature you are. You can make one of two mistakes when it comes to responsibility. One mistake is to take on too much responsibility and feel responsible for other people's thoughts, feelings, and actions. There are always people who are more than happy to throw their monkey on your back and make you feel responsible for what's really their responsibility. Perhaps you heard about the man and his, his son who were into going into town with their donkey. Someone saw them both walking with the donkey trailing behind. How foolish, the person exclaimed. Why are the two of you walking when you could be riding? So they both climbed up on the donkey. Going a little further, they came across an animal rights activist. What are you both doing on top of the donkey? Don't you realize how heavy you are? You're being cruel to this beautiful beast. So the man got off and the son stayed on. As they got closer to town, a passerby noticed the boy riding and the father walking and spoke harshly to the lad. Show some respect for your father. You're old enough to be walking while he's the one who's riding. So the son got off and the father got on. As they were about to enter town, another person saw the father riding and the boy walking and said to the man, did you make your son walk all this way while you rode? Shame on you! What kind of father are you? Well, by the time they made it into town, they, they were both carrying the donkey. That's what happens when we try to please all the people all the time. The donkey, or we could say the proverbial monkey, ends up being on our backs. If we're not careful, we end up carrying extra weight when what we need is a lighter load. Watch out because there are people who will try to put a monkey on your back, something, a responsibility that doesn't belong to you, it belongs to them. The other mistake is to not take responsibility for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. To throw your monkey on somebody else's back. Suppose you're the oldest child in your family and you shove your little brother or sister. You get in trouble for it, but you blame them for what you did. You know, it's their fault that I shoved them. They were being such an idiot. Anytime you blame somebody else for what you did or didn't do, you're being irresponsible. Either mistake, taking on monkeys or offloading your monkeys, damages your emotional health, your spiritual maturity, and your relationships with other people. Love assumes proper responsibility for oneself and others. If you want to be an emotionally healthy follower of Jesus, then you need to agree to this statement. I'm 100% responsible for how I think, how I feel, and how I act, and others are 100% responsible, responsible for how they feel and think and act. If you get this right, then you can love people the way God wants you to love them. And you can love yourself properly. And you can have the closest of relationships. Galatians 6, 4 through 5 in the message says, Make a careful exploration of who you are and the work that you've been given. And then sink yourself into that. Don't be impressed with yourself. Don't compare yourself with others. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Irresponsibility will eat a hole in your soul. You're the one who will be impacted the most 
by irresponsibility. Your irresponsibility in one area of your life often affects other areas of your life. A person who cuts corners in one place, you find them cutting them all over the place. As Ben Franklin said, he that is good at making excuses is seldom good at anything else. There's another factor in play when you're being irresponsible. Every time somebody take, makes excuses or fails to be responsible, somebody else has to shoulder or take the burden that that irresponsibility creates. Have you ever had a job where you couldn't do your job until somebody else did theirs? So you were waiting for them to do what they needed to do and, and you couldn't do what you were supposed to do. And finally, when the deadline is coming up and they haven't come through and there's so, no sign that they're going to, you have to go ahead and do their job too or you won't be able to get your job done on time. In some ways, our whole culture today is becoming less and less responsible. And more and more irresponsibility is virtually celebrated. The thinking seems to be like this. You don't have the right to hold me responsible. At the same time, you're responsible to clean up the mess that I created through my irresponsibility. And because I have certain rights, you don't have the right or responsibility to hold me accountable for my irresponsible life, if you could follow all that. Irresponsibility gets rewarded regardless how it affects everybody else. Irresponsibility is not a neutral thing. It always ends up being handled by somebody, just the wrong somebody. Andy Stanley has said, so in essence, when I act irresponsibly, I'm expecting other people who aren't responsible for me to carry the burden of the mess or chaos that I've created. One of the most un unloving things that you can do is to fail to take responsibility for your life. When you live irresponsibly, you're eventually going to have to pay the piper. All those balls that you've been throwing up in there is going to come down. And when they hit the ground, which they eventually will, then you no longer will be able to deny the realities of your life. The consequences of you refusing to accept your responsibility. Then you will no longer be left with anybody to blame but yourself. Here's another way you pay for your responsibility. Now, you won't hear anybody else talking about this very much anyhow, but it does something inside of you. There's an inner conflict in your conscience. At least your heart starts hardening. hardening. I may be able to convince you that I'm not to blame for something in my life, but I'll never be able to fully convince myself because, after all, I know the truth. Have you noticed that, have you, noticed that you never see irresponsible people smiling after they shift the blame because even when they make it look like somebody else's fault they still carry the guilt and shame of their irresponsibility. It's like the CEO who taken on a new job and the outgoing CEO said to him sometimes you're gonna make wrong choices. You know it's, it's gonna happen you'll mess up and when that happens I prepared three envelopes for you. I left them in the top drawer of the desk. The first time it happens, open envelope number one. When it happens the second time, open envelope number two. And then when you mess up the third time, open number three. Well, the first few months, everything was going just fine. And then lo and behold, the CEO makes his first mistake. So he goes to the drawer, he opens envelope number one, and the message reads, blame me. So he does. He says to everybody, this is the old CEO's fault. He made these mistakes. I inherited these problems. Everybody says, okay, and it seems to work out. Well, things go well for a while longer, and then he makes his second mistake. So he goes to the drawer and he opens up envelope number two. This time it says, blame the board. The board has been a mess, he says. 
It's the board's fault. I inherited them. They're the problem. Everybody says, okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. Things seem to hum along pretty good for quite a while. And then he makes his third mistake. He goes to the drawer, he opens it, and he gets out envelope number three. The message reads, prepare three envelopes. So what was his real mistake in all three cases? Not taking responsibility. Former Maryland poet <clears throat> laureate LaSalle Clifton wrote a poem called The Light That Came, a woman about a woman who lived an irresponsible and unexamined life. She said she closed her eyes, afraid to look for her authenticity, but the light insists on it in itself in the world. A voice from the non-dead past started talking. She closed her ears and spelled out in her hand, you might as well answer the door, my child, the truth is furiously knocking. You may ignore the truth today, but one day it will come furiously knocking. Abraham Lincoln said, you cannot evade the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. On the other hand, Proverbs 28, 13 says, a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Now, it can be easy to talk about, you know, all those terrible, irresponsible people that are out there. But I want to talk about us. There's something in all of us that at times wants to shirk our responsibilities. But as a follower of Jesus, you can't do that. You can't shirk your responsibilities because ultimately you are not accountable to your family, your spouse, your employer, your neighbor, or the government. Now they may all hold you accountable, but you're ultimately accountable to God for how you live your life. Romans 14, 12 says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Christians should be the most responsible people on the planet because when you give your life to Christ, you accept full responsibility for how you've lived and how you will live. That means we pay our bills. We clean up our own messes. We take care of ourselves. We take care of our family. We do our work in an honorable way. We fulfill our obligations. We're not lame by playing the blame game. As we say in recovery circles, we take care of our side of the street. We are responsible for how we live our lives. We're responsible for how we live out our relationship with God. Genesis 17, 9, God said to Abraham, Your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. Since we're talking about emotional maturity in this series, we need to take responsibility for our emotions, especially in how we express them to others. We need to own our emotional reactions. That means we have a responsibility towards people who hurt us. We're responsible to forgive them. Now, that's usually a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Forgiveness, however, is more a choice than a feeling. We choose to let go of the offense. We choose how we will emotionally react to the person who caused us pain. We also own up to when we have hurt others and we need to make amends and make things right with them. Steve Arterburn says, when we own our emotional turmoil, our spiritual stagnation and the hurts we have caused others, when we own the precious gifts given to us by God and the reality in which we live, we're starting to live responsibly. Although we do not choose many of our trials that we face and may not be responsible for them in any way, we are responsible for our reaction to them. Living a responsible life means owning up to the things that we must face. The problem is, it's so easy to do anything but take responsibility. Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. The greatest thing that you've been given is your life. 
The message says it this way, same passage, great gifts mean great responsibilities, greater gifts, greater responsibilities. Not only have you been given the gift of life, you've been given a greater gift, the life of Christ. You are responsible for living a Christ-like life. That means being responsible for how you, you live all of your life. The bottom line, Andy Stanley says, is simply this. To whom much is given, something is required. It's when we embrace that and embrace it through the lens of a God who loves us that we begin to be serious about taking full responsibility for our lives. We were designed to be responsible. And when we shirk those responsibilities and expect somebody else to shoulder the burden, we're not fulfilling our God-given potential. We'll be happiest and most satisfied and have the most clarity in life when we take on what we are responsible for. It's never too late to get out from under the burden of guilt that comes from irresponsibility. God would love to lift that off your shoulders, but that means that you must truly take responsibility for your life. Jesus accepted responsibility for how he lived his life. There were times where he reached his boiling point with other people and how they were acting badly. Matthew 21, 12 through 13 describes one of these times. It says, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you're making it into a den of thieves. Notice that what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, you guys are making me mad. You know, he wasn't blaming. You know, it's your fault that I drove you out. You'll never find Jesus blaming others for how he felt or acted. Jesus was too emotionally healthy to pin his feelings or actions on those who triggered him. Jesus didn't say to his disciples, you hurt my feelings by falling asleep when I ask you to stay awake and pray. He didn't say to the Pharisees, it's your fault I called you hypocrites and whitewashed tombs. You had it coming. He didn't say to Peter, you upset me when you denied knowing me. He didn't say to Judas, you devastated me when you sold me out for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus Christ is the only person who took full responsibility for everything he felt and did. This is one reason that he stood out from everybody else. Not only did Jesus take full responsibility for his feelings and actions, he also put others on the same hook. Never once did he feel responsible for how others felt and acted toward him. He didn't say things like, it's my fault the rich young ruler walked away. I shouldn't have asked him to sell all he had to become my follower. And he didn't say, it's my fault the religious leaders are angry with me. I, I guess I shouldn't have been so outspoken. He didn't say, it's my fault the disciples fell asleep. I've, I guess I've been pushing them too hard lately. And, I couldn't expect them to stay awake and pray for me. No, he didn't do any of those things. The bottom line is, Jesus accepted full responsibility for his thoughts, emotional reactions, and choices. He never blamed other people for how he felt and acted. He never accepted blame for how others felt, acted, or reacted to him. Jesus had perfect boundaries with other people, whether they liked it or not. If you need a model of how to appropriately be responsible, Jesus is the perfect one. We need to be sure that we are bearing the right burdens, carrying the right load. Paul talks about this in Galatians. Galatians 6 2, he says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And what is the law of Christ? Well, Jesus says it this way, John 13 34. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. That's the law of Christ. And then Jesus gave this invitation. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. When people are weighed down by the burdens of life, we are to love them 
like Jesus loved them. Rather than adding to their load, we're to lift them up and to help them find rest for their souls. As Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is that true of you? Is the yoke that you throw around others something that lightens their load, or does it make it heavier for them to bear? Now, a yoke was a wooden frame used for harnessing together a pair of oxen. This made it easier for them to pull together and lighten their load. As we throw the yoke of Christ's love around our hearts, it does not create bitterness in our souls. It does not uh, cause harm in our relationships. We find his help to be just what we need to keep going. It fits our needs at the moment. His law of love does not weigh us down. It lifts us up. So should our love and yoke be in the lives of others. In Galatians 6.2, the word burden means excess weight, something that is so heavy that it weighs us down. It makes a pressing demand on our personal resources. It overloads our circuits. It tends to overwhelm us. Bearing this kind of load requires help because we need someone who will listen. We need encouragement. We need prayer. We need some sign of tangible support. In some cases, we can't carry our load by ourselves. We need practical help. We need people who will accompany us on our difficult journey through life. Here is where we show our responsibility for each other. We get under another's load and help them carry it. As there are burdens that need to be shared, there are loads, one of the other words Paul uses here in Galatians, there are loads for which we alone are responsible. A burden is a problem that weighs us down and is too heavy to carry by ourselves. Loads, however, are weights that we're capable of carrying by ourselves without help and that we alone are responsible for. This is what we've been talking about. Paul makes the same distinction. If you were to look in Galatians 6, 2, 5, he says, carry each other's burdens. The Greek word is barios for burden. And in this, in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. However, each one should carry his own load. And the Greek word portion looks like portion. So loads are our portion, you know, what we're responsible for. Baggage, personal baggage, is what we are alone responsible for. So what are you responsible for? You have four primary areas of responsibility. Number one, you're responsible for your own attitudes. Your attitudes are your property. They do not belong to anybody else. Yet one of the burdens that we can throw on other people's backs is our bad attitude. How often have you said or thought something like, you sure make me mad. What we really mean is, your behavior is responsible for my bad attitude. But no matter what somebody else does, you and I are always responsible for our attitudes. Philippians 2.5 says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now the context of that passage there in Philippians 2 tells us that having the attitude of Christ involves sacrificial love being at the forefront of our relationships. It's full of humility rather than selfishness. It puts others' interests ahead of mine in a way that honors God. So before reacting, we need to ask ourselves, is this the kind of attitude that Jesus would want me to have? If not, our reactions will likely create burdens for others, burdens that rightly belong to us. Secondly, you're responsible for your feelings. Sometimes we try to throw how we're feeling onto others. We can use guilt, shame, anger, sadness, even silence to control people and to get them to do what we want. It's as if we say, because you made the wrong choice, a choice that does not please me, then you are unlovable. You're bad because you didn't do what I wanted you to do. Jesus said, woe to you when all men speak well of you. 
If you're always trying to make everybody happy, then you're going to have trouble pleasing God. If you find yourself feeling responsible when others are upset with you, you're going to end up being controlled by them rather than by God. You'll not be free to honor Him and live in a way that fits who He made you to be. Some of your choices will make other people unhappy with you. But you're not responsible for everybody else's happiness. If nobody ever gets upset with you, then you're probably not living your own life. You're not living the life God intends for you to live. Now, I'm not saying that you ignore other people's feelings and just do whatever you feel like doing regardless. That creates burdens too. You should always be sensitive to how others might feel about your choices, but you're not responsible for how they feel. Sensitivity is on your side of the property. How people feel about what you do belongs on their side of the fence. If either of these things end up on the wrong side of the boundary line, it creates unnecessary burdens. You're always responsible for how you choose to deal, how you choose to deal with and react to your feelings. Third, you're responsible for your thoughts. You're responsible for the thoughts that you allow to float through your mind and be expressed through your life. Now, you may not always be responsible for every thought that comes into your head, but you're responsible for what you do with that thought, whether you let it dwell there and what it does with you, what you do with it. If you're not aware of what you're thinking and believing, your thoughts can roam aimlessly without you considering their substance, impact, or significance. Your attitudes and actions eventually give you the window into the nature of your thoughts. Thoughts tend to come out of our mouths as either burdens or blessings. The message says, Ephesians 4.29, Watch the way you talk. Say only what helps. Each word a gift. Your thoughts and words must be evaluated and subjected to Christ. We talked about that last week in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Whatever you allow to dwell in your mind needs to be under the authority of the Scriptures and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, you're allowed to have your own opinions. You don't have to think like everybody else, only like Jesus. No matter what opinion you hold about any issue, you name it, the most important issue is, are you expressing it like Jesus? If you think being right is more important than right relationships, then regardless of your opinion, you are completely wrong. And then number four, you're responsible for your actions. In a day when people tend to blame everybody else under the sun for their behavior, you alone are responsible for your choices. When Cain was upset with his brother Abel, God said to him, Genesis 4, 7, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. And so God was saying to Cain, you're responsible for your actions, making righteous choices, choices that honor me. When you make those kinds of choices, it pleases me. But when you allow negative thoughts and desires to run your life, well, then you're stepping right into sin's trap. You are very capable of doing the right thing if you choose to do so. I will help you do the right and responsible thing. Now, notice there was emotion, and certain beliefs behind Cain's actions. You need to deal with your emotions God's way so that you act God's way. You, your emotions will affect how you accept responsibility. You are to take responsibility for how you deal with your emotions, and then you're taking the responsibility for how you live your life because of it. You also need to be aware of the beliefs that are driving your life. Believing what is true is what will help you to act in ways that are true and responsible. God has given us tremendous freedom of choice. Responsibility means accepting and wisely using this freedom. The Holy Spirit leads you to live responsibly. That's the only way He leads. Every moment you're choosing to walk with the Spirit 
and live a responsibly God-honoring life, or you're going your own way. You're responsible to live all of your life with love. The more you take responsibility for your life, the more you live like Jesus, and the more you love like Jesus. Dear God, I want to thank you for giving us our life and for giving us your Holy Spirit so that we can live our lives in a way that's responsible and honorable and purposeful. Help us today to see what we're responsible for in our lives and to accept full responsibility for how we think, act, feel, and for what we do. And also, Lord, help us to see where we are responsible to help others. Our brothers and sisters who need encouragement or to come along and help them in some practical way or prayer or somebody just to listen to them. Lord, may we be available because that really is our responsibility is to be there to help in those kinds of ways. And so, Lord, today, lead us by your Spirit so that we live in ways that show it's Jesus Christ who lives in us. And that means we'll be the most responsible people on planet Earth. We thank you for this in Jesus' name.